So I'm excited to invite everyone today to our special webinar. Um, this is focusing on malnutrition awareness week and particularly in IBD patients. And so today we're gonna to be discussing malnutrition and inflammatory bowel disease. And I first wanted to start off by introducing myself. Um, so my name is Carolyn Newberry. Um, I'm currently the director of GI nutrition um, at Wow Cornell Medical Center in New York City. Um, and I'm excited to be moderating this session with um, an illustrious panel of speakers um, who I'm also gonna introduce now here. Um, we have Dr. Stephanie Gold, who is an assistant professor of medicine at Mount Sinai um, in New York City as well. Um, we also have Dr. Natasha Haskey, who's a postdoctoral fellow at the University of British Columbia, um, Occam Walken and the University of Calgary. She's a dual appointment. And finally, we have Dr. Natri Raman. Um, she's an associate professor of medicine and the director of um, the clinician investigator program, as well as the medical director of Alberta's collaboration of excellence for nutrition and digestive diseases in Calgary. And I have our speakers as well as my disclosures here on the screen. And I wanted to go ahead and introduce the learning objectives for this webinar. Um, so we're hoping upon completion of this educational activity, um, those that are joining us will be able to understand the impact of malnutrition in patients with inflammatory bowel disease, learn about the various tools to screen and assess for malnutrition in patients with inflammatory bowel disease, and finally learn about the barriers to malnutrition screening in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And with that, I want to pass it along to uh, Dr. Haskey, where she's going to go ahead and get us started on discussing malnutrition in these IBD patients and review things like background screening and diagnosis regimens. Thank you so much, uh, Carolyn, for setting the stage for us. And I'm happy to introduce this important topic of malnutrition in inflammatory bowel disease. So in general, malnutrition is an underrecognized medical condition characterized by the imbalance between nutrients that body, a person's body requires to function properly and the nutrients they actually receive through their diet. And so this definition does encompass both undernutrition, where there is insufficient intake of essential nutrients leading to weight loss as well as overnutrition, where there is this excess of nutrients, often resulting in individuals living with obesity. Ultimately, both are associated with both macronutrient and micronutrient deficiencies, as well as sarcopenia. Now, malnutrition is estimated to impact 20 to 80% of patients living with inflammatory bowel disease. And generally, patients with Crohn's disease are at higher risk than those with ulcerative colitis, although malnutrition does occur in the colitis patients as well. The majority of these patients um, with IBD-related malnutrition tend to be hospitalized. So the, there's estimates that 70% um, are in, or have malnutrition that are hospitalized in comparison to outpatients where the prevalence is around 30%. And certainly, those that have active disease or poorly controlled disease are at higher risk than those that uh, are in the remission phase of the condition. And so not unlike any other condition, several uh, meta-analyses indicate that malnutrition certainly leads to poor clinical outcomes in inflammatory bowel disease. And some of these include um, increased risk for disease severity, higher rates of infection and increased recovery time, as well as reduced quality of life. And so certainly malnutrition is an independent risk factor for being a thromboembolism, non-elective surgery, longer hospital stays, and obviously this results in higher healthcare costs. And so the etiology of malnutrition and inflammatory bowel disease can be said to be multifactorial and, a and it's a result of a number of factors which all actually can influence each other. And so some examples as shown in this particular slide here is that you know, reduced oral intake can be a problem and that can be a result of anorexia, but it also can be a result of self-imposed restrict restrictive diet. Um, there can be altered anatomy after uh, luminal surgeries, 
leading to reduced uh, absorptive capacity of the gastrointestinal tract, um, leading to various nutrient losses. Um, there can be enteric losses like vomiting and diarrhea, uh, malabsorption, and certainly inflammation or the inflammatory process plays a role in um, the nutritional needs. Now, there are also, um, as we try and treat this condition with various medications, there are side effects um, that can lead to um, that impact intake but also um, there are medication nutrient interactions as in the case of things like steroids or medications like methotrexate. Now, sarcopenia is perhaps an area that has received a little bit less attention um, in the IBD field. However, um, certainly recent meta-analyses estimate that sarcopenia can affect roughly 52% of patients living with Crohn's disease and 37% of patients with colitis. And so although undernutrition is a risk factor for the development of sarcopenia, um, up to 50% of patients living with obesity can actually have sarcopenia. And so as you can see on this figure on the right, um, the etiology of sarcopenia in patients with IBD is, again, not unlike malnutrition, it is uh, multifactorial. And so it's impacted by diet, chronic inflammation, um, there's research suggesting the microbiome plays a role, there's uh, malabsorption, um, reduced physical activity, because these individuals might be living um, with active disease, as well as um, the effect of visceral adiposity. And so given this high prevalence of sarcopenia, and its impact on these clinical outcomes in inflammatory bowel disease, there's certainly recent interest in improving early identification of those with reduced muscle mass. And we want to intervene with these um, individuals early in their clinical course. So moving on to um, the differences between um, screening and nutrition assessment, I just want to highlight this um, for a moment. Um, when we are talking nutrition screening, it really is that preliminary assessment used to identify individuals who may be at risk for malnutrition or nutrition deficiencies. Um, screening tools that we use are often very simple, involving only a few questions or measurements, um, and typically um, are performed relatively quickly to identify potential issues. Excuse me. And there are meant to flag individuals who may require a more thorough assessment. Whereas nutrition assessment, on the other hand, really is more of a comprehensive and detailed assessment of an individual's nutritional status. And it's really used for the purposes of diagnosis. And so it's, the assessment tends to take a little bit more time and are typically performed by registered dietitians or trained healthcare professionals. Now, um, what both these tools tend to have in common is that um, there are two different processes with the ultimate goal of improving patient outcomes. So now both ESPA and the British Dietetic Association have recently released consensus guidelines for nutrition assessment in inflammatory bowel disease that recommend nutrition screening at diagnosis and on a regular basis. However, this in, in actuality, um, this is actually performed infrequently in clinical practice, despite um, these expert recommendations. And so um, when we talk about um, various nutrition screening tools, um, there they they have, there's a variety of tools that um, have been examined in inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and this um, is a really good meta-analysis um, shown here by Lee et al, um, who kind of highlights these screening tools that have been studied. But as you can see on this particular table, each screening tool does have um, different components, um, contain different components, I should say. Um, some include BMI, um, Weight loss is a component, some can include blood work, um, some include diet intake, and some also include disease severity. And so um, what I want to highlight is that um, 
these various tools have um, not been um, validated in all clinical settings. So, for example, the nutrition risk screening tool of 2002 um, has only been validated in the inpatient setting. On the other hand, um, Saskatchewan Inflammatory Bowel Disease Nutrition Risk Index has only been validated in the outpatient setting. So, I think that's important to note that when you are um, if you intend to implement a screening tool in your practice, that you understand the limitations of the of each of these tools. And one particular um, limitation I do want to highlight is a lot of these tools do focus on body mass index, which I had mentioned earlier, um, likely would screen um, many patients living with obesity um, as out as being having nutrition risk, and they could potentially um, be sarcopenia. Um, it also is worth noting that there are some screening tools that can be completed by patients, and um, they're listed on this particular slide. And really, um, I do see some advantages um, to using these particular tools, um, or the nice part about using patient-completed um, screening tools is that it could potentially help with um, earlier detection uh, by patients themselves, um, could empower patients to take a little bit control, better control of their own health and understand um, nutrition, the, their nutrition risk factors, as well as increased awareness of some of those risk factors. Um, and it could be um, a cost-effective way um, to implement nutrition screening in the healthcare system. Although um, I do want to uh, admit that some of these tools do need to require further validation, but What's also important to note is that um, there's actually no specific recommendations or consensus as to which tools should be used in inflammatory bowel disease. Now, moving away from these screening tools and uh, moving more into nutrition assessment, one of the most widely used tools um, for a, a variety of health conditions, including inflammatory bowel disease, and is considered the gold standard is the subjective global assessment. And so it does provide a very comprehensive evaluation of um, nutrition status based on uh, subjective and objective information. And it does offer some valuable insight into patients' overall nutritional health, um, categorizing them as well-nourished, moderately malnourished, or severely malnourished. And so, of concern is that 62% of patients with IBD have been diagnosed with some degree of malnutrition based on the subjective global assessment criteria. There are some inherent limitations to this tool, and as the name suggests, um, it is a tool that is of subjective nature. Um, so there is the concern with inter um, rater variability, and it certainly um, is dependent on the the person that's administering the tool to have some uh, clinical experience in this area. And um, another concern is that it does lock some uh, quantitative data uh, for precision. And so despite these limitations, um, it is highly predictive of um, health outcomes. And the second tool I just wanted to highlight really is this um, Tool that was developed by the Global Leadership Initiative on Malnutrition, and it's referred to as the GLIM. And this was developed um, really as an international effort to standardize um, the diagnosis and classification of malnutrition in clinical practice. And so it really was developed by a uh, experts in the field. And so the strength of this GLIM is that it lot it. There is um, standardized criteria, um, and it takes um, a very standardized approach to diagnosis, diagnosing and classifying malnutrition, um, and can be used across healthcare uh, healthcare settings. Um, and in, as I mentioned, it's an international effort, so it can be used in a variety of, country, of countries. Although um, one of the challenges of this uh, particular tool is that it has not been um, validated in the IBD population. So basically um, this tool um, does, it, it's based on phenotypic criteria as well as ideologic criteria. And um, to diagnose malnutrition, 
a patient must satisfy one major criteria um, from each of the phenotypic criteria and etiological criteria to um, be classified as having malnutrition. And finally, I, I do want to emphasize the importance of anthropometric assessment in the inflammatory bowel disease population, especially when assessing for sarcopenia. And so in the past five years, there have been numerous studies evaluating the prevalence of sarcopenia um, in patients with IBD, and they've used various tools, including CT, MRI, uh, bioelectrical impedance analysis, as well as DEXA. And um, the, the, the studies are limited in the fact that there's really no um, clearly established cutoff values um, for diagnosis of sarcopenia um, or low muscle mass in the inflammatory bowel disease population. And so although we acknowledge that um, some of these tools have their limitations, um, they are they can be for, considered for anthropometric assessment. But we also need to acknowledge that some of these tools might not be readily available um, um, at the bedside. So we can use surrogate markers um, such as hand grip strength, mid-arm muscle circumference, um, bioelectrical impedance analysis, as well as some of the serum biomarkers um, to um, examine sarcopenia and use it as a sort of non-invasive uh, diagnostic diagnostic tool. So um, now I'll pass things back over to Carolyn. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hasky. That was a very nice overview of the prevalence of malnutrition in the IBD population, as well as some screening tools you can use to assess for this condition in this population. Um, I want to now set the stage for discussing how to screen for malnutrition in an IBD clinic and sort of some practical guidance. Um, and we're going to actually be hearing about real life clinics that are happening right now um, at the University of Calgary and at ICANN School of uh, Medicine at Mount Sinai. Um, so I'm going to turn the attention over to Dr. Raman and we'll go from there. Thanks very much, uh, Carolyn, and to Natasha for setting the stage for this portion of the conversation. So um, now, um, as a gastroenterologist and nutrition-focused physician, uh, back in 2012-2013, uh, the results from the Canadian Malnutrition Task Force were released. Now, the Canadian Malnutrition Task Force, otherwise known as the CMTF, sought to establish the prevalence of malnutrition amongst admitted inpatients in hospital in Canada. And much to our surprise, we identified that between 45 and 50% of patients admitted to hospital were either moderately or severely malnourished. But when we looked at discharge summaries or clinic progress notes, in fact, malnutrition was only highlighted as a problem in less than 1% of cases. Now, when we turned this attention towards our GI population in particular, we uh, very quickly understood that this, uh, this segment of the population was at potentially even higher risk than the, the average admitted inpatient. So we started screening for malnutrition in hospital and required a place for these patients to have follow-up. So in response to that, we developed a specialized high-risk malnutrition clinic in 2012 at the University of Calgary. Now, initially, this clinic was open to individuals with inflammatory bowel disease, as well as pre-liver transplant cirrhosis, with uh, the outcomes related to malnutrition being um, what fairly widely known even back a decade ago. Um, now, uh, since then, over the past few years, our malnutrition clinic is open to any individual with any GI diagnosis, including items like gastroparesis and intestinal dysmotility syndromes. For the purposes of this talk, I'm going to talk specifically about how we provide nutrition care to malnourished patients with inflammatory bowel disease. 
So we were very fortunate to overcome the very first barrier when it came to developing this clinic, which was to advocate for funding, to have a registered dietitian who was knowledgeable about IBD patients specifically to co-lead our high-risk malnutrition clinic. So our clinic is staffed by both an IBD-focused registered dietitian as well as two gastroenterologists who have nutrition expertise, one being myself. So our clinic, in fact, is in response to screening that has already previously been completed by uh, other gastroenterologists and IBD-focused physicians at our center. So we have about 12 gastroenterologists who provide care to IBD patients at the university, at, at my site, at the Foothills Hospital at the University of Calgary. And when any of these gastroenterologists identify patients who have had unintentional weight loss, active malabsorption, poor oral intake, restrictive diets, surgical resections, or uncorrectable micronutrient deficiencies, they put in a referral to our malnutrition clinic. Now, at this point in time in 2023, unfortunately, our wait lists are exceptionally long, but, uh, but up until I would say the past year, we were able to see these patients within six weeks. Now, at a very high level, the clinic um, visit would include review of active IBD, and I'll get, get into all of these details in just a moment. Um, we would collect dietary data based on uh, uh, patient-completed 72-hour food diaries and then 24-hour um, dietary recall completed by the dietitian during the clinic visit in real time. And then both the registered dietitian and myself as the physician will independently complete subjective global assessment um, ratings on our patients. And we would discuss any um, areas of controversy and solve these by consensus should there have been discrepancy in coming up with the SGA diagnosis. In addition, patients will have hand grip strength completed, as well as completion of mid -arp, upper arm circumference as a measure, surrogate measure of sarcopenia, waist circumference, weight height BMI, and then ultimately we will provide individualized dietary recommendations. Next, please. Okay, so first, when we talk about the dietary evaluation, um, we had to think about a way to have the data already available for us so that we could analyze it in real time when the patient came into clinic. So we sought approvals um, from our clinic administrative staff, and any patient who was booked into our malnutrition clinic would complete a three-day food diary prior to their clinic assessment. And an example of that food diary is highlighted here on the right-hand side of your screen, whereby the individual would document um, the time of day food was consumed, the quantity food was consumed, and then any physical activities that happened in parallel. When we started this clinic about a decade ago, in fact, we were handing out food scales so that patients could weigh their food for a more accurate assessment. However, as our clinic has grown, uh, this is no longer sustainable for routine clinical practice, although we continue to do this for research purposes. So the patient, after completing their food diary, will bring in their food diary the day of their clinic visit. And then when they meet with the dietitian, the dietitian will lead a 24 hour validated food recall to validate the food record that was actually completed and fill in any gaps. And ultimately the goal is to identify timing of meals, overall energy, frequency of meals, dietary quality, intake of protein, fat and fiber, as well as other micronutrients, and to assess any barriers to intake, such as financial access, um, dentures or chewing problems, um, and other barriers to care, such as psychological aspects, mood, mental health, etc. Next, please. Now, after, um, uh, so after that has been completed, um, we already would be in receipt of various anthropometric assessments. And this would have been completed by the clinic nurse who would be responsible to check in the patient after they register practically at the front desk. <laughs> 
So when the even prior to being seated in the clinic room, patients will have had their weight completed, their actual BMI or their measured BMI. And I say that because a small proportion of patients may actually have concerns with volume overload or peripheral edema, especially if they have co-diagnoses with liver disease, as many patients tend to. Um, if they do have any significant fluid um, concerns, we then calculate a dry weight and a dry BMI using validated formulas. Um, the clinic nurse also will complete the hand grip strength using the Jamar dynamometer, as well as the mid upper arm circumference and waist circumference. All of these assessments are documented in the electronic medical record and in, in um, of themselves, uh, none of these um, individual uh, findings are necessarily acted upon. However, they all provide um, direction and a comprehensive 360 assessment in order to inform with more accuracy the nutritional status of the patient at that time. And they also provide uh, a method for monitoring. So once we calculate these baseline values and we provide interventions, it, it is an excellent way for us to see how change evolves over time. Um, also, uh, we then complete a panel of micronutrient assessments, and specifically for IBD, uh, in all patients, we will capture data on serum ferritin, iron, and TIBC to have a better understanding about iron deficiency anemia. There's a high prevalence of vitamin D deficiency in IBD patients, especially living in northern latitudes like Canada, so we will routinely measure 25-hydroxy vitamin D3 as well as other fat-soluble vitamins such as vitamin A and INR as a surrogate for vitamin K. We don't have universal access to vitamin E. We do have to send these out. So this is not something we routinely do. All of our patients also have vitamin B12 completed, serum folates, and zinc. Ideally, the red blood cell folate is a more robust marker of um, uh, of a recent uh, intake. However, uh, at this point, we simply have access to serum folate. So we do utilize that um, uh, with, with interpretation based on uh, our overall assessment of the patient. And then finally, we do see some patients that may have suspected cardiomyopathies or other uh, concerns um, that, uh, for selenium deficiency, and we're seeing more and more surprisingly vitamin C deficiencies in this population as well. So we don't measure these routinely, but on a case-by-case -case basis. Next, please. So now, when we first started the clinic, we started collecting data on some of our patients, and we still do today, but in perhaps a less structured way. And I'm going to present just some um, uh, data on our early experience with the clinic. So uh, initially, we assessed a total of 45 patients who were seen in the high-risk malnutrition clinic during the study time period, of which about half were uh, female. The median age for this cohort of patients was 48, and for the purposes of this study, all of them had Crohn's disease, um, perhaps uh, speaking to Natasha's earlier point around Crohn's disease patients being referred more frequently for suspected malnutrition. Of this cohort of patients, 13% had a prior small bowel resection, and only 7% had a diagnosis, official diagnosis of short bowel syndrome. At baseline, um, we found that our patients had a mean, a median body weight uh, of 58.5 kilograms and BMI of 19.8. Just over a third were considered well nourished, meaning that just under two thirds were considered malnourished, um, either uh, moderately or severely so. The total energy intake overall was 1,755 kilocalories and mean hand grip strength 31.4 um, kilograms, uh, mid upper arm circum circumference 27.2 centimeters and waist circumference 84. Now, keeping in mind, these are all pooled data. And when we look at cutoffs or thresholds for the various anth anthropometric measures, these are typically classified based on age as well as sex. But I'm just using uh, providing you with these baseline aggregate data so that you can see the changes that have occurred over time. Next, please. So now, if for the purposes of this data collection, we, uh, we saw patients at baseline, 
And then they had two subsequent follow-ups. The first follow-up occurred four months after the baseline visit and the final follow-up 10 and a half months after the baseline visit. So we see that over time, there was an increase in body weight from baseline to the final follow-up. We also see there was a significant increase in body mass index over this time period as well. Now, looking at the nutritional markers, we see that more patients were considered well-nourished over the uh, time, uh, time period. And we see that significantly more patients were less malnourished as indicated by fewer patients um, in classes, uh, subjective global assessment classes uh, B and C. Overall, we see that total energy intake increased significantly over uh, the two follow-up periods, as did functional measures such as the hand grip strength. We didn't see any changes um, in the mid-upper arm circumference or the waist circumference, potentially suggesting that functional changes may occur independently of actual um, uh, anthropometric uh, muscle uh, observations. Uh, next, please. Um, so thank you. I'll pass it back to Carolyn. Sure. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Raman. That was very interesting. Um, and now we're going to hear about an experience in New York City with a similar concept, different clinic. Uh, Dr. Gold? Yeah, thank you so much. And thanks, Maitri and Natasha, for the intro. So we'll talk a little bit about our clinic here at Sinai. And I would just want to start by saying that much of the way we designed our clinic was in conjunction and discussion with a lot of guidance from Mitri and her group. So I greatly appreciate all of your help and support in getting our clinic up and running. So we developed a specialized nutrition IBD clinic here at Mount Sinai in New York City in about July of 2022. So it's been up and running for almost a year. And the goal of our clinic was really to identify those patients who are either at risk for becoming malnourished or who were malnourished and provide them with specialized comprehensive care to improve their nutritional status, but even more importantly, to change their clinical outcomes. Our clinic is similarly run by a physician with training in nutrition and IBD, myself, along with an IBD-focused registered dietitian who's been at Sinai for many years. Thanks so much. And so one may ask how patients are referred to our clinic. So many years ago, they were screening, uh, the system at Mount Sinai, they were screening for malnutrition with a very simple tool called the MST. And then these were sent to the new dietitian in the office for an evaluation. However, we realized that we weren't capitalizing on that moment in the visit with the provider and the patient to have a discussion about nutrition. And so we needed to be able to alert the physician to the findings. So currently all patients seen at Mount Sinai in our IBD center screen for malnutrition using the MUST tool. And this is standard of care. Everyone is getting in. It's done by our medical assistant when they are checking the vitals. Positive screens actually trigger a best practice alert in our electronic medical record. We use Epic. And this alert allows the physician to see that the patient screened positive during the visit so that they can have a conversation with the patient about their nutritional intake, the fact that they've lost weight, et cetera. So not only does the provider find out about it, but they also get a list of potential micronutrient labs that they might be interested in ordering based on the screening test. And this provides a direct link for a referral to our clinic if they feel that the patient is at risk or would benefit from being seen in our clinic. This also allows the provider to make a judgment decision. Perhaps the screening accidentally included somebody who had intentional weight loss. And so therefore, if there's a conversation during that clinic visit, the patient may say, well, I was in fact trying to lose weight. I've been at the gym, et cetera. And so then they, they'll make a decision about the referral based on that. Other mechanisms of referral to our clinic, sometimes providers will email us directly. Patients who are seen in the hospital by our IBD inpatient nutrition team will often be referred uh, after their, their discharge. Next, thanks. So just wanted to touch base about the MUST screening tool as I mentioned it before. So this is the tool we're currently using in our clinic. However, we use somewhat of a modified version based on the IBD chorus paper that came out a few years ago. So the MUST tool takes into account a patient's BMI, asks about weight loss and specifically unintentional weight loss. But the original tool has a third component which is an acute illness score. 
And it is essentially given to patients who have had no nutritional intake for five days. And we realize that this is not really relevant in the clinical setting. When we're seeing patients who are home, it's very unlikely that we're going to have patients who've had absolutely no oral intake in five days. And so therefore, we've changed this to make it a little bit more IBD focused. And so we ask patients about the presence of diarrhea or any decreased oral intake for the last two weeks. And we use that as our acute illness score. Just want to also just to emphasize what Natasha already said, the MUST tool is a screening tool and risk assessment. It is not diagnostic. Next, please. Perfect. So prior to our clinic visit, patients are asked to fill out a form, very similarly to Matry's Clinic, um, and this form includes a couple of different components. There's a 72-hour food diary where we ask for information about two weekdays and one weekend, what they're eating, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, as well as snacks and drinks. We ask for a weight history for three to six months based on the patient's knowledge. What has their weight trend been over the last six months? Have they seen a big drop? Have they been gaining, et cetera? Excuse me. We ask them about dietary history, food preferences, food avoidance, any specific diets they might be on. Are they on a kosher diet? Are they vegan? What are they currently eating? It's very important to us. And more specifically, what are they avoiding in the diet? A lot of IBD patients, if you ask them how their diet is, they'll say it's great, but that's their baseline diet. And when you actually dig deeper, you might find out that they aren't eating any fruits and vegetables. So it's really important to ask, are they eating fruits and vegetables? Are they eating raw produce, et cetera? We do an ARFID screening on all of our patients, and that's to look for any you know, psychological component to their eating that we need to be aware of. We also do a food insecurity screening using the hunger vital sign, especially with the economy in the last couple of years. It's incredibly important to make sure that we understand their access to food before providing guidance. It's very hard to make suggestions if you don't know what patient's access is. And we finally ask about their goals for the clinic visit. And I found this to be one of the most important things. It's really nice to know what a patient's looking for when they're coming in. If they want to talk about hydration and you spend the hour talking about fruits and vegetables, that's not what they're looking for. And so we really try to focus the visit based on their goals. Next slide. Thanks. So during the clinic visit, patients come in and we do a very brief IBD history and symptom review first off. We have a 24-hour dietary recall that's led either by myself or the dietitian, And we use the GLIM score for malnutrition diagnosis. We talk a significant amount about hydration and oral rehydration as a lot of our patients have diarrhea, they may have a high output ileostomy, and it's so important to ask what patients are drinking uh, to compensate for these GI losses. And we talk a lot about weight restoration, whether that means somebody who's lost weight and really trying to gain that back, somebody who's gained weight on steroids, et cetera, and is hoping to lose some of that weight. Similarly to what was discussed before, we do do anthropometric testing. So all of our patients get a height and a weight and a BMI is calculated. We do hand grip using the same digital uh, dynamometer, the Jamar. And so we do that on all of our patients. We get bioelectrical impedance analysis on all of our patients using an in-body scale. And then we also do muscle anatomic assessment through ultrasound on many of our patients. Almost everyone gets micronutrient testing when they come in for their initial visit and then follow up as needed. That includes, we also get CBCs and basic metabolic panels, inflammatory panels. Similarly, as Maitri discussed, we get an RBC folate, a B12, iron panels. The other micronutrients listed here are somewhat patient specific, and that's a little bit because we wanna make sure that we're guiding the care towards what our patients need. So for example, if a patient mentions that they're not eating many fruits and vegetables, we'll get a vitamin C. If they're having a lot of diarrhea, we'll get a zinc level. And then really important just to remember to look for things like ARFID, food insecurity, sarcopenia, is there an IBS overlap, pancreatic insufficiency? And we identify these things and then refer out to the appropriate teams. Next slide, please. Perfect. So just some quick initial results. We've only been doing this for a year, but just so we can get a sense of what we've seen. We've had 112 initial visits in the first year and 59 patients have had a minimum of one follow-up. 16 have had three or more follow-ups. Again, the majority of patients had Crohn's, although I will say about 30% had UC. So that's excellent that we are seeing some patients being referred with UC. About half are female. And the majority of patients did report active symptoms at the time. So they're either having diarrhea, loss of appetite, abdominal pain.
Very interestingly, over 90% of patients reported some type of food avoidance at the first visit. And this isn't just, oh, I don't enjoy nuts or something, but this is a full food group that they're completely avoiding due to their IBD. And so when we ask them the questions of why they're avoiding, you see 77% said it's to reduce symptoms and 35% said it's advice from a provider. So certainly patients are being told to avoid these foods. In addition, in terms of the other screenings we're doing, about a quarter of our patients reported food insecurity in the last year, just highlighting the importance of asking these questions of our patients. 40% told us they worry about the impact of food on their IBD. Over 50% reported being a selective or picky eater. And over 80% reported restricting their oral intake due to fear of worsening their symptoms. About 5% of patients had a diagnosis of an eating disorder prior to the initial visit. And with that, I'll turn it back to Carolyn. Um, so thank you, Dr. Gold um, and Dr. Roman for discussing your respective clinics and sort of how you're doing that in real life. Um, we're now gonna uh, go back to Dr. Haskey, who's gonna talk about some barriers to screening and diagnosis in the IBD population. I'm going to pass this over to Dr. Raman, actually. Thank you, Natasha and uh, Carolyn. So, um, so Dr. Gold and I have been chatting about uh, some of the barriers and challenges that we've noticed after having our IBD um, uh, malnutrition clinics up and running for some time now. And even though um, our clinics um, are definitely well subscribed and our waiting lists are uh, potentially uh, fairly long, undoubtedly there continues to be several challenges both on the nutrition screening side as well as on the nutrition assessment side. So first thinking about nutrition screening, um, now, our clinic, uh, our, IB, our GI clinics actually are often mixed clinics, so, meaning that patients uh, with IBD and without IBD are all are seen together in a provider's practice. So the first question, now, although ideally every GI patient, I would argue, should have some screening for malnutrition, perhaps this is of greater importance in the patient with IBD. So given restricted time and resources, in mixed clinic settings, how do you actually identify a patient with IBD is, is our first real challenge. So when a patient comes into the clinic, they're met at the receptionist's um, uh, area. And the receptionist typically does not know the diagnosis of the patient um, and why they're uh, there in the clinic setting um, on that given day. So uh, when there is part, when we're part of a mixed clinic, identifying the IBD patient is in fact challenging. So assuming we can identify an IBD patient, then what is the best modality to screen? So um, Stephanie talked about um, how screening is done at her site. And despite our malnutrition clinic being up and running for over 10 years, we still don't have a great way for screening, although we have, um, I would say, a good process for nutrition assessment. So should screening be a self-screen? Should it be a provider-led screen? Where is this done? Who does this? Where are the results documented? And who acts on the results? Uh, Stephanie uh, um, described how um, she, is, she has the buy-in of her clinic staff and, and a beautiful way to handle this via the EMR that she has has um, described using EPIC, but not all centers use EPIC or some centers are very new EPIC users, for example, our center as a case in point. So we fully don't have a great way to, as of yet to document the results or um, identify through alerts which patients are actually malnourished and how the results are then acted upon. Then do we utilize a central screening approach or individual screening approach? Now, ideally, central would be optimal. Central meaning that all patients who uh, are part of a clinic receive uh, the same um, screening processes. But in our clinic, for example, there are 12 physicians. So does each physician do their own screening or um, do we pull together resources so that every physician's patients are screened? And then as Natasha identified very nicely up front, there are a myriad of screening tools that are available and have been validated in different populations, but very, very few that have been validated in the IBD setting in particular. So which screening tool should we use and what rationale do we use to defend it? 
And um, our group has published on this um, fairly extensively, but I would say that still we do not have an adequate gold standard screening tool that we can broadly recommend. And that's why perhaps these are miss specific suggestions are missing from guidelines. And then finally, what about capacity? Uh, Natasha outlined that up to 30% of outpatients are um, uh, potentially affected with malnutrition, do we actually have the resources, the nutrition professionals, the registered dietitians to be able to handle positive malnutrition screens? So that's on the screening side. So what about nutrition assessments? So I know at our site and, and potentially in Canada in general, the adequacy of skilled IBD nutrition professionals, both MDs as well as RDs, potentially is lacking. I think this is an important skill that we need to grow and develop. And uh, I hope that various organizations um, will think about offering courses and practicums and internships to be able to assess this gap. Practically in our clinic, although um, we we think we have a process whereby patients can complete food diaries effectively in advance of their clinic. Oftentimes patients don't do that or it's inadequately completed, so we're working from partial data at best. Many of these patients have multiple appointments. They're seeing their gastroenterologist, they're seeing their psychologist, they're seeing their dietitian. So what about the compliance to attend? What is their bandwidth to be able to do that? And then it's important to acknowledge that many patients do have ideas and have, and have read extensively on the role of diet and nutrition in IBD. And many do come in with preconceived ideas about the role of nutrition. So to Stephanie's earlier point about negotiating goals of the visit, this is something we do very well. And I I think it's important um, uh, to, uh, to do this so that everyone is satisfied with the clinic outcomes. And then finally, as Stephanie has described, many patient, uh, patients um, uh, have uh, financial insecurities that potentially may, may limit the actual implementation. And there are many other implementation barriers, including organizational and systemic as well, that um, potentially may actually uh, limit the actual assessment. So with that, thank you, and I'll turn it back to Carolyn. All right, um, well, um, that was a wonderful presentation. And to close us off, we did wanna share some additional resources for both patients and providers. And so here are some highlighted uh, resources from the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. You can see that there are some diet and nutrition educational handouts, as well as some professional educational uh, resources for healthcare providers. Uh, additionally, although Aspen currently does not have any uh, guidelines or resources for patients with inflammatory bowel disease, that's certainly an active interest of the organization, and they will be looking to build some evidence-based guidelines in the future. And with that, we're just going to summarize this presentation here. Um, so in conclusion, after this wonderful uh, set of speakers, um, we all now know that patients with inflammatory bowel disease are at increased risk for malnutrition. Um, we also know that malnutrition in patients with this condition is independently associated with poor outcomes. Uh, guidelines currently recommend screening at the time of diagnosis and regularly after. Although no specific screening tool has been deemed superior to another, that's still um, an area of active research. And finally, patients with inflammatory bowel disease that are identified as high risk for malnutrition um, and who engage in a specialty nutrition clinic with a registered dietitian and gastroenterologist and nutrition expertise have been shown in preliminary studies, which we saw with Dr. Raman and Dr. Gold's clinics, um, that they have improvement in muscle function as assessed by hand grip strength, total energy intake in terms of caloric calories intake per day, as well as their SGA scores, so their malnutrition risk assessment. Um, and with that, I want to thank your, our speakers for joining us in this really exciting webinar and closing this session out.